as a teenager and uh, in college and medical school, I um, always wondered what is the 21st century and modern Christian going to look like? And uh, what is our generation going to be remembered as? And I hope it's more than COVID. So this evening, we find ourselves looking at the modern 21st uh, Christian and church. And I promise you one thing is that although I read 26 verses, uh, I promise you that the message is not that long. But I will promise you that uh, you probably will miss the Suns game or the rest of the game. Uh, this evening, we find ourselves looking at the modern Christian and church. Uh, we are at a crossroads, even in our church, at New Life Romanian Church. One of them is transition of language, right? We are going from Romanian to English. It's transition of priorities or changes in priorities, wearing a suit or, and tie versus maybe more casual, uh, maybe socks or no socks. The idea is that we are made some changes and generational changes happen. The other aspect of it is you can see our worship team, right? And praise God for them because they're amazing. But there are some changes from the transi- traditional um, a traditional church, a Romanian church that we have with one piano versus the entire team, right? Uh, in Christian cross-examined, Kenneth R. Samples writes, before students used to ask, does God exist? Is Christianity true? Did Jesus really rise from the dead? Over the last decade, the questions have changed, and the questions are now about Christian relationships to slavery, violence, such as the Crusades and the Inquisition. The substance of Christianity has been replaced by sentimentalism, the emotion of things. We become more emotional. And uh, one great president would call us uh, snowflakes Christians to some extent. But the idea is that we have become somewhat a more on the sentimental aspect of things. And case in point, and I'm going to use some examples from the church because it has to be, not that it's our church, but one of them is worship songs, right? Instead of evaluating songs based on the word, which is, does the song align with the word of God? Does it use the correct word to bless, to praise God, to bless him, to honor God? use the word Jesus and Son and Holy Spirit and the Father. Instead of using some of those words, we and other churches and the generational aspect of care more about the rhythm, how fast it goes, how high you can lift your hand, how fast you can beat your foot. And the reality with that is that you are valuing and we are valuing sentimental songs that within two hours, that feeling disappears. This is a real big dilemma for our generation. On one side, we have the truth, which is the word of God. We can read it. We can live it. And on the other side, we have the value of a sentimental experience that we want. That within two hours, that sentimental experience disappears. That is a major reason why our rates of depression, anxiety, PTSD, drug use has been on a rise in our country. Because we put value on a sentimental experience that disappears. And what happens? When that experience disappears, we are left empty, lost, confused, disoriented. And the only option you have is to either go and get a quick fix to get that sentimental experience or you get lost in a deep, deep hole. Now compare that to the nourished, to to a nourished body that reads the word of God. So we need to nourish our body with the daily bread that comes from the word of God. And then we start to experience something different. Love, kindness, faith, mercy, joy. In Christ, that lasts an eternity very different aspect of it. And that experience is what we we want. But see, change happens and it's inevitable. Change from one generation to another happens and it's not the problem as long as we stay within the boundaries of the truth. 
And it's right here. The boundaries of the truth are found in the word of God. And we get to John 17, and I believe it's the perfect passage for our times because only Jesus would, would know what is going to happen. Only Jesus knew what would happen to him. And that's why he says, Father, the hours has come. Only Jesus knew what, would be, what the years are going to be like for the disciples. Only Jesus knew that today we're going to have this conversation, that we're going to be talking about this. Only Jesus knew the date that you will meet him. And if you've already met him, praise God. And if you haven't, then it's time to meet him tonight. I say that because, you see, I believe that Jesus speaks, in the, speaks and when he says something and it's in, it's in the word, that he has an ultimate plan. You see, this prayer made it on these pages of the Bible for three reasons. One, and Pastor Samuel spoke so greatly about, is to bring God glory. It's a reminder of God's glory. The second part is instructions. Instructions to, to, to help us live our lives according to the will of God. And third is assurance. Jesus prayed. You wouldn't know what that means, that Jesus prayed for us? I mean, if there's nothing in us that reassuring you that we will be delivered, it's right here. He prayed for us. That is the most certain aspect that we one day will be with him in heaven. You may have read John 17 before and possibly even read it quite fast. But it's important to recognize today that Jesus is praying. And two, Jesus is praying for you. Jesus is praying for me. John 17, 20 says, my prayer is not for them alone. Speaking about the disciples. Prayer, also, I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message. So from generation to generation, from disciple to disciple, it's gotten to you. For me, it was February 1997. You know your date. And if you haven't, maybe tonight. But see, Generation, generation, disciples to disciples. And therefore, one disciple makes another disciple. That's why this prayer is for us. Tonight, we will go through Jesus' prayer for the modern Christian. Uh, we find Jesus in John 17, pray, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son that your son may glorify you. Easter just passed just a few weeks ago for us. We know what that means when Jesus is praying. And we know that his crucifixion and death is imminent. In the chapters before, we see Jesus teaches disciples. He sits with the disciples and teaches them. In chapter 15, he tells them that the world will hate them. In chapter 16, he tells them about the Holy Spirit, that their, their grief will turn from sorrow, from grief will turn to joy. And now in chapter 17, Jesus is face to face with God the Father and prays for his disciples and for all believers, which includes us, the modern Christians. The entire prayer applies to us for multiple reasons, but most important that we are both believers and disciples as we established. In Matthew chapter 28 to 18 says, all authority is in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Jesus starts his prayer asking God the Father to glorify him so that he can glorify the Father. Jesus prays for, for you granted him authority over all people that he might give eternal life to all those you have given him. You see, at the cross of Calvary, this plan was put into action. You see, God... Send Jesus, his son, to die for you on the cross. And after generation for generations to receive him through the blood of Jesus Christ. That was the plan all along that God the Father put into motion that you and I be saved through that blood. I don't know about you, but really amazing that after 2022 years, we have the same message and the gospel is the same that was brought into the world through Jesus Christ. A modern Christian and church gives God glory. A modern Christian 
and church gives God glory. A modern Christian must recognize and give God glory. We're good at recognizing that. I mean, have you been to Grand Canyon? We go there and we're in awe. How amazing God's creation is. I don't know about you, but the Hubble telescope can look at 10, 15 billion light years away. And uh, astronomers can see far, far galaxies, and black holes, and stars never seen before. And you look at that, and you look at that, and you have to be in awe of God's creation. But we're really good at recognizing that. But how good are we at bringing and giving God's glory? Giving God's glory requires an action. God the Father followed through on his plan. He initiated the action. He sent his only begotten son to die for you. And Jesus brought him glory, the Father, by dying on the cross for us. So now it's our turn because we are in Jesus. Now it's our turn to act and glorify the Father. No better way can you glorify the Father than to confess your sins. Nowhere and no better way can you glorify the Father when you confess your sins because you recognize God's glory and you, can, you, you recognize His love for you. You recognize how much He loves you, that He gave His only Son for you. You recognize His righteousness. Confessing your sin is one action that is followed by a reaction. And in Romans chapter 10, verse 9, you will learn that after you confess your sins, you declare that God and Jesus is your Savior, that God is Lord in, 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 your, in your heart. This act of confessing and declaring with our mouths that Jesus is our Savior and that God is our Creator must not stop the day of our baptism. He doesn't stop that. In fact, declaring that I am a Christian is no longer enough. Declaring that you are a Christian is no longer enough. You know why? You know what they say behind you, behind your backs? He's perfect. He's a good kid. She's a good girl. They won't do anything. They're not like those evangelists on television that try to get Trump into become president. They're like those people on television. They're good kids. They'll just sit in his bench. They'll be in front of his computer, do his work. He'll sit in the classroom, write his essay. They're not doing anything to us. They're not bothering us. That's what they say about us. Confessing and declaring with our mouths that God is Savior has been seriously overlooked by our generation. I know this is true because I see what is happening in the world. We, the modern Christian, are afraid to declare that we are believers in God. We are afraid to stand for the truth. We are very loud in church and sing at the top of our lungs, and some can reach your hands any higher, but do you declare his name in public? Do you declare his name in the classroom? And you should. I've watched preachers speak on public college campuses. And how many people and so many young and even older teachers, they end up cursing that preacher and yelling back at that preacher. But what do you expect? I mean, if you go out in the street and you start preaching, what's going to happen? They're going to yell at you. They're going to throw stuff at you. But what do you expect? When we speak, Satan and his agents yell even louder. You're not there for them. This preacher on the campus at UC Davis, and I remember very much looking at them and, I, and, and, and seeing what's happening, I realized he's not there for the people that yell back. It's for those two or three people, only two or three people that are in the back listening because God is speaking to them. Thousands could be there. Millions could be there and yell back. It doesn't matter. You're there for that one person. We're at your job at your work, at your school, wherever you are. One person changes, it's party time in heaven. One person changes, it's party time in heaven. You see, giving God glory is not bound by time, location, or situation. You must give God glory at all times, anywhere and under any circumstance. Now, John 17, 6, Jesus continues his prayer and says, I have 
revealed you to those whom you have given me out of the world. They were yours, you gave them to me, and they have obeyed your world, your word. Now, Jesus continues his prayers for his disciples. We've established that we are his disciples, but I want to make sure we stay true to the word. Right here, he's praying for the disciples at the time, he, the disciple that he had, not for us. So that this part is for the, for the disciples at the time. And that's just for accuracy perspective. This part of the prayer is important because the disciples, one, belong to the Father. Were given to Jesus, right? And they obeyed the word. And the second part of the modern Christian and church is that the modern Christian church obeys the word of God. I've said it before, but we have to say it again that in order to obey the word of God, you know, you have to know the word of God. You have to read the word of God. Knowing the word of God is the foundation. Our knowledge of the word of God must be strong so when we are tested, that we can stand for the truth, that we can stand and obey all the way till the end. There are a lot of great examples in the Bible of men and women that made it into the hall of obedience. We have Abraham, right? Obeyed God all the way to the point of losing his own son. We have Moses that obeyed God and led to taking his nation out of Egypt. We have uh, David who obeyed God and he ended up being the messianic lineage to Jesus. I said there's also women, right? And I want to read to you Esther from Esther. Let's go ahead and open your Bibles to Esther chapter 4, verse 15. Then Esther sent this reply to Mordecai, Go get, gather together all the Jews who are in Susa and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my attendants will fast as you do. When this is done, I will go to the king, even, even though it is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. The reason I wanted to read this part of this is because obeying the word of God starts on your knees. Obeying the word of God starts on your knees, and we live in a world with its own challenges. And when there's something that happens, we try to jump in so fast. And uh, and if there if there is a if there is a problem, we jump in as, as soon as it happens. And what happens is that it may not be the time to jump in. It may not be the time because it's not God's time. You see, when you lack the foundation, the word of God, you make decision that is impulsive. You make decision that is impulsive. Impulsive means reckless, hasty, irresponsible. And we see this, and I want to stay again with the church because it's the best example. We see this in our relationship with each other. Right? That should be built on unity as we will learn shortly. The true biblical relationship involved fellowship, trusting each other, building each other up, comforting each other. But instead, when someone wrongs you, may it be by something saying, saying something hurtful or, or talking behind your back, we become impulsive and lash out and hold grudge, and some of us will even plot revenge. When one of us is wronged, we should be obedient to God and, first of all, get our knees and pray. Second, open the word and see what it says about our relationship in the church with each other. And let's see what, it, what, it, what Jesus prays further about this relationship aspect of it. John 17, verses 11b and John 17, 21. Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name, the name you have given you gave me, so that they may be one as we are one, that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. You see, as I'm, I'm writing my message, I stopped there. And I didn't go any further. And I wrote here, we should probably stop tonight. 
I couldn't go any further. Because the friendship and relationships and brotherhood and sisterhood, all those walls better come down tonight. I couldn't go any further. And we shouldn't go any further until we understand what Jesus is praying here. We are not a social club. We are not Romanian Baptist Church against all the other churches in America and in the world. We are not brother against brother. We're not sister against sister. We're definitely not leader against leader. Yes, the we are one body of Christ. One body of Christ. Yes, the body of Christ is made of different parts. And we, as we learn from Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 12 to, 20, uh, 12 to 14, I, I won't read that because of time. But we receive the same Holy Spirit and are one in Christ. That changes our relationship, our friendship, our brotherhood, our sisterhood. We are like-minded. We are united. It means we believe the same thing. But more important is that Jesus is the head. Jesus is the head means that we go where the head tells us. We don't go to the right on our one wheel or go on the left the way we want. We all follow what Jesus tells us to do. If we pull in the same direction, if we agree on the same standard, which is the word of God, then the world will believe that Jesus is the Son of God. That is the ultimate calling. Others must see Christ in us. So when they come to our church, when they go to youth night, they will see Jesus. John 17, 15 starts with, My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. We're coming towards the end, uh, but I want to make sure we, we speak about this because as I was preparing the message, I was so deep into the message that I realized I could have come up with like five more messages. And that's what happens, especially when you're for the first time, you're trying to time yourself. Uh, maybe one day we will be able to talk about in the world, not of the world. Something that we can talk about at youth night. It's important, especially nowadays, that modern Christians are protected from the evil one. Every day I hear about an evil plot. Every day you read about a... Uh, a God godless society and what happens in our godless society. And some of you have, may have heard of California Assembly Bill 2223, which aims to shield women and other birthing people from criminal and civil liabilities in the event of self-induction or self-induced or criminal abortion or infant death due to pregnancy-related causes. I'm picking this bill for example tonight. One is because it's the most recent one. Um, but I want you to understand something. A godless society will make ambiguous bills that will be fought in court. A godless society makes ambiguous bills, such as this, that are fought in court. This is a prime example of such a bill. As the children will die, and as bill, this bill opens the door, okay, just opens the door, that this child might die up to 28 days after birth. So as that opens the door, that will never be fought on the streets. That will never be fought in church. That will be fought in, uh, in court by some doctor with, Im with no moral compass, with some judge that is worse than immoral compass, and it will be fought in, 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 a, law, in a court of law. Now, let me be clear, I've spent a lot of time thinking about this and probably I, I, an entire day in which I just couldn't have a better explanation for you. We can spend an entire life fighting against abortion, fighting against same-sex marriage, fighting against uh, for social prayer, for school prayer, fighting for the Constitution, fighting for freedom. You can spend an entire year doing, uh, an entire life doing all this and miss eternity. You understand how serious this is? You can fight an entire life for all the right reasons and lose your place in heaven. 
Now, I'm not saying, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that you shouldn't be fighting. In fact, if you read the word, it's our responsibility to stand for the truth, which includes all those fights. But what I'm telling you is that your soul and your salvation is more important to Jesus than the world out there. Your salvation and your soul is outmost important to Christ. This prayer is for each and every one of us, individually and as a church, a body of Christ. This prayer is for us because Jesus knew was what to, was to come. Jesus knew that on the cross, he defeated Satan. But guess what? Satan is still loose and his agents are staging the greatest assault our church has ever seen. Satan is, is staging the greatest assault that our generation and our children's generation has ever seen. And this is a fight for my soul, for your soul, for our children's soul. The prayer is out for our protection. This is about me and you. In Luke chapter 18, verse 8, Jesus says, However, when the Son of Man comes, Will he find faith on earth? Will he find faith on earth? I believe Jesus asked that question knowing the answer. And the answer is not that pleasant. The question to you is, will you and I be one of those faithful if he comes tonight? I'd like the worship team to come up. The great thing about it is that this message and this prayer ends with the greatest assurance there ever is. John 17, 24 says, Father, I want those you have given to me with me where I am and to see my glory, the glory you have given me because you love me before the creation of the world. A modern Christian and church gives glory to God gives glory to where glory is due. A Christian, a modern Christian and church obeys the word of God, are one in Christ and united and are protected. And I thought about how, what would be the best way to finish uh, besides the song that, that I just love that we're going to sing tonight. I wanted to read from for you from Romans chapter 8. And I want you to stand up, everybody. I'm going to read from you for you from Romans chapter 8 starting with verse 31. What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is with us, is for us, who can be against us? Who, he who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies who then is the one who condemns no one. Christ Jesus, who died, more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we face that all, the, all day long. We are considered sh sh as sheep to the slaughter. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am con convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither, be, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor, nor anything else in our creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.